Welcome to Destination White Look through the score, take a beat and a plow! Gotta believe. Here's enough wild game meat for all of us. It's January and we're in Mexico. I mean, what better place to be than Mexico in January? Uh, we're south of the border in Sonora. I'm hunting with a good friend of mine, Ted Jaycox, with Tall Tine Outfitters, and I am just so pumped to put my boots to some of this terrain. It is almost exotic down here. I mean, coming into the Mobabi Ranch where we'll be hunting, it was like every mile we came down the gravel road, it was like we were shaving another year, another decade away, um, stepping back in time to when, you know, basically things were a lot more simple. I think people come to Mexico just for a change. Um, just the lure of Mexico, the culture, the food, the people. I've been coming down here since 2002 and it's a real simple process, uh, very safe. You know, we're in an area in the mountains secluded away from any of the, the troubled areas that people perceive Mexico to have. Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting place to come and do a hunt. You know, I think there's a lot of undue concern about traveling to Mexico. You know, you read about it in the papers, the crime. I really didn't feel any of that. You know, if you're going with an experienced outfitter, I mean, he's been through the drill dozens of times. There's a lot of border stops, um, customs, things of that, but it's all part of the experience. <laughs> Roberto and Alice Valenzuela are the owners of Mababi, and Roberto's dad actually bought the ranch in the early 40s. It's just a tremendous landscape, and coming here to hunt is one thing, but, but once, once you've been here for a few days, you fall in love with the people and the food and, and the way you're treated, and uh, that adds to the whole experience of coming down for a coos deer hunt in Sonora. The accommodations and the food here are to die for. I just love the camp atmosphere here at Mobabi. It's almost like stepping back in time to simpler times when people actually sit around and talk. Just think of all the things I have to put up with. No, 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 no. That is true. All the people. That is true. I would give you that. <laughs> you go back to an empty house. <laughs> this coos deer hunt is, is similar in some ways to a spot and stalk mule deer hunt. We're uh, getting up early. We're going to some elevated uh, glassing areas, spending several hours there looking for the coos deer. This is my second coos deer hunt, so I kind of knew what to expect. I knew it was gonna be spot and stock hunting on steroids, because this terrain, it's not only that it's very vertical, uh, it's, it's really rocky, so you're always stumbling a little bit, you're always trying to catch your feet, you're always trying to catch your breath if you're from the Midwest. The area we hunt coos in here down in Sonora ranges from about 4,500 feet elevation up to about six or 7,000, so it's always good to, you know, to come in shape and be prepared for, for a strenuous hunt. I knew it was gonna be a challenge, but I was really physically and mentally prepared for it. So our first afternoon out, we only had a couple hours after their trip in from Tucson, climbed up to a little hill, saw a couple bucks, had the dilemma of the first day like you generally sometimes do. Do we take this buck? He was a borderline 100 inch deer, which is kind of the, the benchmark we've set for ourselves. And we thought, you know, we might be able to do better than that. Let's give this a little bit of time. And the fact that he was about 370 yards away. Got some great, great exposure, got to look at some deer, but in the end, we decided to pass on that deer. We hunt these coos deer in a variety of terrain. A lot of big hillsides, rocky outcroppings, ocotilla, cactus, and we also hunt them in the oak trees. Um, this particular part of Sonora on Ranch Mababi has just thousands and thousands of acres of oak trees. And the deer obviously like whitetails, they love the acorns, so we hunt them in those locations as well. In a way, it's almost intimidating hunting coos deer. They are small. I tell you, when you look at them in a scope, 
It reminds me of hunting coyotes. When you see a coos deer at 300 yards, you put the scope on him, you go, oh my God, he looks like he's 600 yards away. It's because I'm used to seeing big Midwestern deer. These deer maybe weigh 120 pounds and they're so elusive. They blend in so well with their surroundings. These coos deer are a very diminutive species. They average around 120, 125 pounds. So the racks obviously are smaller too. In fact, it only takes 110 inches to make Boone and Crockett on a coos deer. You know, judging is it's a very important part of you know how we hunt them down here in, in Mexico. Main beam length, you know, mass, length of brow tines, you know, all those factors come into play. And even just you know going from a four-inch brow tine to a two-inch brow tine can make a big difference on a coos deer score. We got up high and we started glassing and glassing and glassing. Gordy spotted a buck, but it was about 1,300 yards away. We can drop off this ridge, go through the bottom, hit the Alexander Ridge, and bounce our way. We had to go off the mountain, cross an arroyo, up the big mountain to the end of a ridge, and we sat there for about six hours. It was a long, grueling sit, and you know, Gordy and I glassed and glassed. We never were able to pick up that buck. When we return, he was right on the top of the hill, uh, bedded down. I mean, this was a gift. Ted called the yardage, 184 yards. I was still in disbelief. I was saying, no way, Ted. There's no way I missed. This is Destination Whitetail. Gordy Cron is in Mexico hunting the little known coos deer, and he's finding that their smaller size, combined with the steep rugged terrain, makes this one of the most challenging hunts on the continent. They're just a, really a difficult deer because even if you see one at 600 yards, you think, well, all we gotta do is sneak in and get a little closer. Well, that's not easy here. I mean, you're talking very vertical terrain. It's very physical, and if you're not prepared for it, it can be pretty intimidating. The variety of terrain these coos inhabit are from the rocky outcroppings and Ocotillo covered hillsides to the thick oak valleys. A big part of what we do when we hunt coos deer down here is glassing. You'll spend hours and hours and hours looking through a spotting scope or through binoculars, so having good glass is really important. If you're wondering exactly where these guys are hunting, they are in the Sonora region of Mexico, just 50 miles south of the Arizona border. This mountainous area is wedged between the Sierra Madre and the Gulf of California and features sweeping landscapes that offer plenty of hiding spots for the coos whitetail they are pursuing. So we're back at it the next morning. We had, you know, about another quarter of a mile to go. We we're just gonna scale the hill, get up on top and start glassing again. Well, we hadn't gone another 200 yards and, and Ted was easing up the hill just to have a peak before we committed to going over. And all of a sudden, he comes sliding back down. He said, there's a buck, there's a buck. Here. As it turned out, right we spotted a buck that was bedded. Right away, my heart just started pounding. He was right on the top of the hill, uh, bedded down. I mean, this was a gift. He wasn't that far. Ted called the yardage, 184 yards. I was settled in, I was rock solid. and I missed the shot. You missed. What? Yep. Ted says, you missed. I said, no, no way. There's no way I missed. I was on my bipods. I was settled in, I was rock solid. The buck turned around and ran off. I was still in disbelief. I was saying, no way, Ted. There's no way I missed. We need to go look. But well, we went and looked around and, <laughs> I mean, Ted was positive I missed. He just had to convince me. I don't see anything. No, uh, you know, just the way he reacted to the shot. But I was just solid. I was on the bipods. Hey. I mean, it was a shot. It happens, man. We've all heard it. It's hunting, right? And things happen. People miss. There's malfunctions, you know, things beyond our control. And when that happens, you just got to kind of take a deep breath, collect your thoughts, get back into the game, knowing that there's going to be another opportunity down the road. You know, when we got back the first night after our hunt, I learned that my Minnesota Vikings had lost their playoff game and, and that Blair Walsh 
had missed a chip shot, 27 yard field goal with 20 seconds left to win the game. And at that moment, I was no longer mad at Blair Walsh. And I think I know how he felt. I felt like I'd let my team down. And then of course, my first thought is the rifle's gotta be off. So, you know, Ted suggested, we really need to check your rifle. Let's go back down to the ranch. Let's go to the range and let's throw some lead out there and just see what the rifle's doing. I think I see it and it's right where it should be. Beautiful shot. You're two inches high and a quarter inch left. I saw that. Perfect. So I suck. The rifle's fine. <laughs> you can call me Blair Walsh for the rest of the day. But... That's a shame because the rifle would have been easier to fix. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I needed that. But yeah, there we got, you know, 100, 200. Um, all I can think is that I jerked the shot left because, you know, looking at the footage, we would have seen low. Right, into the dirt. And I can't imagine I went high because I guess it could have been high. Uh, it certainly wasn't right because I would have had to pull it all the way across his body. So, yeah. I mean, it was just operator error. I mean, at least this gives me confidence, the confidence to, level to go back, to go back there. Yeah. So. And then it's... Um, Quarter 11, got all day. Yep, go get one. All right. I knew the rifle was shooting well. Um, I knew I'd probably get another chance. Let's just go get it done. When we return. Welcome back to Destination Whitetail, where Gordy Cron is on a coos deer hunt in Sonora, Mexico at the Mababi Ranch. They offer a hunting sanctuary of more than 100,000 acres, available to only a handful of hunters each year. This family ranch is currently owned by Roberto and Alice Valenzuela, who left their Silicon Valley jobs to live full-time on the ranch. They manage the herd of coos deer with the help of wildlife biologists and strictly limit the number of hunters to ensure minimal hunting pressure. If you're thinking about coming on a coos deer hunt, just, just understand it's a five day hunt. It's not a one day hunt, it's not a half day hunt. You're gonna spend some, quite a bit of time glassing. You're gonna have some physical exertion. Uh, you're gonna see some phenomenal country and you just can't get in a hurry. It only takes 110 inches of antler to make Boone and Crockett. Think about it, 110 inches. But these are small deer and their antlers reflect that same small size. So you really got to pick them apart um, and you really got to size them up before you decide if you want to go after them. Gordy was forced to pass on this encounter. It's a classic example of there being just too much grass and brush in between him and the deer. And the guys move on into the foothills again. Gordy and I had a little bit different strategy. We were gonna start from the bottom instead of the top. We just glassed up into the hills and we were really surprised that we were seeing very little action because we'd seen a lot of deer on that hill um, during the course of our hunt and there was just nothing going on that morning. And Ted said, you know, we just need to start doing some climbing, um, get some elevation and do some more glassing up there. Uh, it was straight up and down where we were going. So we got our gear together and off to the races. So it was, it was probably a four or 500 yard climb up to, to the peak where we thought we could get, look down into this bowl for this big deer. We wanted to stay on the back side of the ridge just in case he was still in that bowl. We eventually made our way around to a spot where we could get in the shade of a little oak tree and set up in glass for a couple hours. 
the optics play an important role in, in discovering the animal and then ultimately judging the animal. What I like to use is I've got a pair of 15 by 56s and I mount them on a real steady tripod. They're steady, they're hands-free, I can sit comfortably and spend hours and hours glassing for animals. Once I've found a coos deer that I'd like to get a better look at, I'll put the spotting scope on the tripod and, and really zoom in tight. This 95 spotting scope by Swarovski here, it's got 70 power, it's a variable zoom so you can really zoom in tight and get a lot of detail. There's nothing worse than walking 1500 yards through this unforgiving terrain to find out that you've got an animal that's you know one that you don't want to shoot. The third piece of the optics ensemble that I like to use during coos hunting is a set of 10 by 42s. I keep them around my neck, they're close by, they're handy. This time of year in Sonora, the bucks are chasing does. There's a lot of movement. You can scan a greater area in a quicker amount of time with the 10 by 42s. So they, they give you that flexibility of being able to look behind you, look to the side, maybe look downhill where the 15 by 56s that are fixed on our tripod, they don't necessarily give you that flexibility. So you want to have good quality glass. It'll make your hunt more enjoyable and more successful. Destination Whitetail is brought to you by Browning Trail Cameras, by Alps Outdoors, exceed your expectations, by Thompson Center, America's master gunmaker, by Nikon, the next generation in hunting optics, by Analogix, protect your herd with the power of science, and by Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. When we return. A couple days later, we were still looking for that next buck. And, you know, Ted was really working it. He was really working hard. So time was running out on Gordy's hunt. And we knew where this particular buck was. He was a very old, very mature buck. A couple days later, we were still looking for that next buck. And, you know, Ted was really working it. He was really working hard. So time was running out on Gordy's hunt. And we knew where this particular buck was. He wasn't one of the biggest bucks we'd seen during the trip, but he was a very old, very mature buck. Uh, he'd been chasing does. We saw him in the afternoon. And we just came over the first bench, and I look over, and there's a buck, and he's running. I can, his tail, I can see his, his frame. And Ted got the, the binoculars on him just before he disappeared. He said, that was our buck. We just bumped our buck. And he's going down this cut, and Ted said, let's circle around, let's get some elevation. Maybe we can get ahead of him. Maybe we can see him getting up the next slope and, and get a shot at him. And we get up to the top, and we find a little bit of shade, and we sit down and start glassing. But, you know, an hour later, we're still glassing, and now we're starting to have our doubts. Okay, the buck just blew right through here. He's gone. What do we do now? And then Ted looks up, and he sees a couple does. He said, wouldn't it be something if that buck stepped out and was chasing those does? And out of the corner of my eye, I caught some movement, and I look over, and this buck is coming out of nowhere. He's got his nose down, and he's trailing those does. Yeah. I said, wouldn't it be something if those two, if that buck saw those two does and he came up out of the bottom to him? And it wasn't 10 seconds later that he, you said, there's the buck. He's a great management deer. He's an older deer, he's gone down hills genetically. And you know, in my opinion, I don't measure these coos deer in inches, I measure yeah. them in vertical feet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you paid the price for this boy. Cool, they are awesome. He's an older deer for sure. Older deer, he's shrunk way down, main beams are down. He's got nice mass through here though, doesn't he? Yeah, for a koozie dust, yeah, absolutely. For, yeah. Look how small their bodies are. Oh, these are small deer. Oh. Hey, it's a tough target. Good shot, man. <laughs> Thanks. Congratulations. <laughs> this is tough country, and getting a koozie deer out 
even though they're 120, 125 pounds, can be a chore. So one of the options we have here at Mababi is to uh, have Tico and Claudio, the two cowboys, bring their horses in. It's a neat experience just watching them come through the mountains and they'll throw that coos deer right up on the saddle horn. It's amazing to watch those horses carry that coos deer down some of the steep grades that you might even be afraid to walk down. If I could give one piece of advice for anyone that's coming down to do a coos deer, it would be to prepare for the hunt in so many ways, physically and mentally. You need to be prepared for the challenge of hunting in very difficult terrain. You need to be patient. You've got five days, don't rush it. Enjoy every minute of the experience. My name is Ted Jaycox and I own and operate Tall Town Outfitters. We have a trophy coos deer hunting operation down here in Snor, Mexico, about an hour and 45 minutes south of the border. There's a lot of apprehension among traveling hunters about coming into Mexico and, and hunting. And just want to kind of give you an idea of what we experienced down here and why you shouldn't be afraid to travel to Mexico. We've been coming here since 2002 and have had, had absolutely no trouble whatsoever. Uh, and part of the reason for that is, is we travel during the daytime, we don't go into town, we don't go into places we know we shouldn't go into. And our particular ranch here at Ranch Mababi, we're off the paved road about 45 minutes behind two lock gates. Now, I mean, there's other areas in Snore that are perfectly safe as well. Um, so I would just encourage any of you guys that, that, are, that are interested in coming to Mexico to not get caught up in some of the media hype about all the trouble they're having. It's not related or directed to American hunters. So it's totally safe. Please come see us in Mexico.